hopefully asking 50 questions in, to, uh, today. Uh, we've also been in touch with uh, Carlo Vitterini, a uh, good friend of the college, on uh, <coughs> things to, to think about asking. Um, as well as uh, one of our alumni, Bill Cooper, who was uh, with Time and then recently retired as president of, uh, of Business Week. And uh, <clears throat> so we have a bit of an interesting legacy also at Concordia in the media. And uh, Bill Cooper uh, said, first off, uh, before we actually get to the Q&A, that it would be appropriate to kind of get a sense of, of where you are uh, for you to do four minutes on, uh, on read. And uh, the targets that uh, you serve. Sure. Um, the, uh, the parent company is Reed Elsevier. It's based in London. It, similar to Unilever and Royal Dutch Shell, is an Anglo-Dutch conglomerate. Um, although it truly is an unusual corporation, increasingly less unusual, I should say. It truly is a global company. And what I mean by that is 55% of the shareholders are actually Americans. If you looked at the board, it's a relatively remarkable mix. It looks a lot like the NATO treaty uh, with a substantial uh, American influence on it. And more than half of the revenue, more than half of the staff are actually in North America. Um, it is almost entirely uh, publishing. Uh, of that, the substantial, the largest single chunks of it are electronic. We are very much a new media company. In fact, it's one of the uh, unusual stories in the press that the press actually relatively little focuses on because we serve professional markets. We have things like Elsevier Science, the Lancet in the scientific areas in healthcare with a leading provider of healthcare information. Uh, to doctors and uh, scientists in the healthcare space. We also have things like LexisNexis, which many of you might know or use on occasion. And then we have, we produce more trade shows than anybody else in the world, about 600 of them, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then finally, we do a large portfolio of business to business magazines, such as the ones that were mentioned earlier. Um, it is about, uh, I, you got to bear with me because the pound and it, it trades both in pounds and euros and dollars. So I, people ask me, well, how big is it? And it kind of moves by the day. But it's approximately six to seven billion. Um, it's also an extraordinarily profitable enterprise, uh, unusually so uh, for media, and uh, a remarkably defensive one because it's principally subscription revenues. So it's a very unusual beast. Uh, but because we're press shy and don't talk much, um, we sing, uh, we say. Uh, we generally stay out of the papers for that reason. We do occasionally have a little scrape, but that's kind of fun. So, is that helpful? That's helpful. Great. Um, I, we woke up today to read the New York Times had won a record by Pulitzers. At the same time, we know that they are struggling yes. to make ends meet. Uh, Seattle Post Intelligence has mm -hmm. folded. The Boston Globe is, is losing $7 million per month. Uh, my question to you initially is the state of uh, print journalism, and where do you see we are in that transition from traditional to new media, and in what, both from a business model point mm -hmm. of view and also content point of view, where, yeah. where are we, where might we be going? Well, it, it, print needs to be divided into different kinds of print. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the, the press has focused a lot on newspapers. And why don't I just start with newspapers for just a minute. Uh, newspapers have truly the worst of all worlds right now. Um, the, the, my, a classic example, my wife uh, was searching for something um, a year or two ago, and lo and behold, she found um, uh, eight different opportunities on Craigslist within one hour. It was inconceivable that she could have done that on a classified ad in a newspaper and it would have taken at least sort of a week to get uh, the right turnaround. And that just tells you that newspapers' fundamental business model, because classified ads were the largest source of their profit, is simply disappeared. It's gone. Um, interestingly, uh, the readership also has begun to decline very rapidly, and particularly among younger people. And uh, the consequence of that is pretty toxic, which is there's no reason for advertisers to use the business model, and the readers are finding it less and less attractive uh, means uh, you don't really have a business model, for lack of a better way to say it. So I, I think there is a tremendous restructuring underway, and I don't see a lot of sunlight to be honest, on the horizon for newspapers. Uh, consumer magazines, a little bit different story. Um, they are migrating to the web, uh, particularly on the advertising side. And unfortunately for them, the online advertising prospects are looking less attractive for some reasons which we might want to go into. But the good news on that 
is that for the right consumer magazine, the print still is a viable option. It just is a little tough in this economy right now. Um, there are numerous advertisers, particularly large categories such as automotive and finance, which have simply gone dark. By which they're they're not. It's not a matter of advertising in print versus electronic. It's not advertising at all. Um, and that will change. Uh, obviously, they will come back when the economy gets better. And magazines, I think, will be pretty robust uh, for a declining gently business model. So that's the, notice how I phrase it. Pretty robust for a gently declining business model. But honestly, tobacco is pretty robust for a gently declining business model, and they've made billions for years. So you can go quite a while on a gently declining business model. Um, if you look at uh, other kinds of print books, I think also uh, I just got a Kindle. I don't know whether you all have Kindles, but that's that's pretty slick. And uh, my census books also will be a gently declining business model, although probably not at the speed of advertising dependent models such as consumer magazines. What does this mean for content? Well, if you look at traditional business media, um, uh, traditional business models, the media content choices were made by elites. Uh, some of them actually in this room, by the way. And um, <laughs> so I'll be careful what I say here. And they were good choices. <laughs> um, for that time. <laughs> exactly. But the thing that's extraordinary about the internet is that the choices of content are increasingly made by anyone who simply takes the time and effort to publish something. And that means the filter, which used to be um, a range of editorial decision and appropriateness and all the news that's fit to print or whatever it is, uh, has very much shifted to what Google sees as relevant to an audience. And that means it's chaos. <laughs> But I just want to follow up with that. How do you see a business model for supporting quality online journalism? For example, the New York Times website is, is excellent. What are some all those different potential business models that are floating out there? Do you see one of them emerging as stronger than another, or is there yeah. something we you might have, have gleaned that we haven't been reading? Well, about? first of all, it's important to see that the Wall Street Journal charges. Um, and they have a very large, robust business model. It's also probably worth seeing that we charge, my company, Variety, will once again start charging online very soon. Um, and we, we took the paywall down in 2006 in November, and for reasons given, which we can talk about, but it's going back up. So I believe there will be uh, opportunities for paid content online and that we will pay for them. Um, but that's a slightly different question or answer than if you ask me, will USA Today or the New York Post or sadly the <coughs> New York Times or the Washington Post see a viable online paid model? I'm, I'm very, very skeptical about that. Um, and the reason is, is because uh, it's largely general interest stuff. The people that are willing to pay for that stuff, even sort of high quality general interest stuff, are vastly smaller when you multiply the amount they're willing to pay times the people that are going to pay it doesn't equal the cost of producing that. It just, the economics don't work. Um, and that's really uh, quite worrying. So if you are addicted to your morning New York Times or your New York Post or your Wall Street Journal, different story, um, I think it will be a tough road. Kind of the same genre of rethinking the, at least the traditional business model. Uh, what were the revenues of Reed five years ago and compared to today? Uh, of my business, of your business. my business. Streams of reading, five years ago versus well, when I joined, let me. This is slightly easier math for me. When I joined in 2000, uh, electronic revenue was three percent. Uh, this year, it'll be 34 percent of the revenue. So, okay. although it could be 36 of the current trajectory of print, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke. The print's like this right now. It just it doesn't matter where you are. It's just straight down. And I mean, could you unpack? within that, yeah. that remaining 70% of, is that going to continue to migrate, or is where, where is that going to go? No, I think there's a, a, an argument that says some print revenue goes away and is not replaced at all. Um, and the reason is, is because the revenue online is simply less expensive than print. And the way to see that, um, a, an economist might look at that and say, well, the excess cost of supporting that print is a value that has been released by Google and is being transferred to advertisers and consumers. That's, that's the way an economist would see that. Meaning there was excess economic cost or rent, rent <coughs> trapped into the traditional business model and that they were inefficient and that has to go away. And I think you're seeing that across the board. By the way, we're talking about print. 
very similar dynamics in television and music and some others. So it isn't just a print thing. We can come back to that. So. Well, that was exactly my next question. Oh, right. could, could we expand that out to the other? Oh, videos? sure. Television's in, in real difficulty. If you think about what's going on with, first of all, think about the traditional model of print. What they did is they created a uh, scale-oriented enterprise that aggregated advertisers who wanted to reach an audience and serve the <coughs> audience on the other side. And, that, and their choke point was the cost of just <laughs> finding the audience and distributing a print vehicle to it. That sounds a lot like television. If you just take the word print out, what they are is a scale-oriented enterprise, particularly on the broadcast side, that aggregated an audience on one side and sold access to the audience to advertisers on the other side. And the, the elements of their, their choke point, if you will, were broadcast licenses. There were limited slots on TV. If you were like me, you had three channels in Denver when I was growing up. I guess it was four with, with the public channel. But, um, and then it expanded to 150. But even, even now, 150 is not 300 or 1,000 or 2,000. It's 150. And by the way, they're controlled by the same crowd of companies. Um, so there are choke points going forward. Um, it's not at all obvious as we all get broadband that television will look a lot like, well, to be perfectly honest, the print media right now in the sense that uh, there will be no choke points. You can go right on the internet and you can get anything you want in any video format that you want. And moreover, the cost of delivering relatively high quality video content has plunged. So I got to tell you, you can be as, as entertained looking at what my nine-year-old creates and posts on the internet as you might see uh, somebody paying a million dollars a half hour to create. And that's very worrying for their business model. Um, and a question now from, uh, from Joe Cooper, who says this has regard. Uh, How's he doing, by the way? He's doing great. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, I'll give him a call. Um, he's, he's, one of the things he was talking about was community, the sort of the jargon of community marketing, drawing people with like interests under, under a single tent. Right. And um, look, do you have any examples of how we use this community marketing today? Uh, yes. Uh, variety in Hollywood is very much an insider's uh, sport. Um, it's, it's not just about you know, what uh, uh, Zac Efron did this weekend. Um, it's very much more about uh, who is the next studio person, who, what deals are being put together, and things like that. And whether it is print or online or events, we very much focus on the 63,000 people who really matter in Hollywood. And frankly, it's more like 1,500 when you go to the, who, who really calls the shots and has the money. And um, uh, that crowd is an area, uh, is really the sole focus. And so whether it is a special party at the Oscars that you can't get into, or whether it is special tools and services that we do on Blackberries and other things, we're very, very focused on that very elite community. And our advertisers, one, one of the reasons Variety, despite, well, it has recession <coughs> problems, but one of the reasons Variety remains relatively attractive is if you want to influence one of the 5,500 members of the Academy to get your picture selected as an Oscar, we're still the most efficient and effective channel for that. We, we've got a built-in base that is just not yet, has not yet been disintermediated. And so that's one example. The other, we have lots of examples, for example, in construction where we bring architects and engineers together to think about green building products. And we have an online tool that will help them actually model the development of a, like if you wanted to replace this building, we've got an online tool that will allow you to estimate the replacement cost. And we're developing a tool that will also allow you to modify that estimated cost depending on whether you want green carpet, meaning environmentally sound carpet or not. So lots and lots of examples of community. The other uh, piece uh, was really the portability of uh, uh, the mission of many media content providers um, in order to find more, more revenue streams. Um, how does we approach that? Um, getting content to, uh, if, you know, if you can find additional revenue streams for the content that you have? Well, yes. Um, uh, one area of revenue, for example, that media companies have not done well, uh, excuse me, most media companies have not done well, some have done really well, I should take that back, um, is in a world where the decision to advertise is increasingly complex, you can put your marketing spend wherever you, in many, many different venues, getting good quality advice on where and how to use that um, is a really valuable thing. And media companies have traditionally been sort of choke points for advertising spend more than advisors to advertisers on how best to get the most out of their money. Um, 
and that sort of agency or advisory revenue, and particularly in things like search engine marketing, this is the business of going online and buying keywords and then, sell, and then using the keyword uh, to drive some other revenue. Uh, for example, if you sell shoes, you go on Google, you buy the word shoes, um, and you can then uh, find someone who's looking for shoes and then sell them a shoe. That business, search engine marketing, is also very complex. Media companies have a fair bit of experience in the area, and they're really good at bringing those skills to advertisers who are not as good. Those are the kinds of revenues you could see, so, in addition to event revenue and other stuff. That, but that's, that sort of advisory service, I think, is an increasingly sustainable and interesting place for uh, media companies to be. The only problem with it, to be honest, is that it's not a large chunk of revenue. It's not going to replace the core engine. It'll help around the edges, though. Um. Over, over coffee earlier, you had mentioned that uh, business models used to be very dull. They and, were. And, and, and we and liked dull. <laughs> dull was great. Well, now they're exciting. They're very dynamic. Could, could you could you please elaborate on, on some? Well, of I mean, the co the classic phrase, of course, is creative destruction, right? Um, and and uh, w what I mean by that is one of the reasons. Um, it's interesting that up until up until really the internet. Uh, the business models in media were relatively stable. There was not huge innovation that was um, disruptive. It was more continuous evolutionary innovation. And so what that meant was the typical business model was pretty much like I said, which is whether it's newspapers or magazines or television, they had a choke point. The choke point often had a regulatory dimension of some sort. And the, what they did is they had a very stable base of advertisers that would spend because that was the only place to go. There was only one place to spend in the, most cities. Um, and there were only so many television stations. And that was a very stable business model. It was effectively an oligopoly or a comfortable monopoly in certain instances. And so honestly, what you saw on the business model side was um, the kind of creativity was in branding. It was in content. The content side was very interesting. Um, and the rest was uh, a, very, a, a very stable, a really nice business, wonderful business, mm -hmm. um, uh, like clipping a coupon bond It was in many ways. Um, that, that's obviously on its ear because the choke points, the things that made you not have to compete very hard, have now gone away. And what are we looking at? And, and you're looking at really chaos, which is um, <laughs> <laughs> opportunity, but chaos. Um, no, uh, on the content side, it's particularly wrenching. Uh, we should talk about that. And what, what I mean by that is the people that create the content, edit the content, produce the content, distribute the content, um, uh, those folks are uh, professionals. So they're craftsmen. And they're all, interestingly, in, in, many, in many instances, elites. And the uh, artisans, uh, but very high quality artisans. And in the current model, the capitalist system, for lack of a better way to say it, is just grinding down the economic rent that was used to supply that. And the pain is considerable. And, and by the way, it has all sorts of external pain, which I hope we get to, such as what happens to people that actually care about high quality journalism and news. And I think we need to talk about that too. But, um, but the capitalist system is just mowing this whole business model process down. And it's uh, a definite worry. So let's talk about the content, yeah, issues of content. Where are we going? I mean, we depend upon high quality content to be intelligent uh, uh, you know, citizens in the society. Um, well, there is something uh, deeply worrying um, in my mind, because it's almost as if we're all taking a collective leap of faith that in a world of perfect information, when I say perfect, let me rephrase it unfiltered information, not perfect information, <coughs> unfiltered information, that we're going to trust everyone, all of us, to be responsible, thoughtful filters of that information. And the plain fact of the matter is there's not a huge amount of evidence that we are. Um, the, the, uh, there's multiple instances over time, almost Orwellian instances, where you see uh, information very easily manipulating large groups of people or whether groups of people go into sort of um, rages or mob mentalities for periods of time. And uh, unfortunately, for the vast majority, in fact, I wouldn't even say the vast majority because Bernie made off such an interesting example, people tend to believe what they want to believe, whether it's true or not. And, and in a world where responsible decision making necessitates that we all have a, a clear filter and moreover that we're getting pieces of information that don't fit that filter, that 
other pieces of information holding up a mirror to us, it's very, very worrying that we no longer have a business model that appears to be able to support that kind of journalism. And frankly, we're just mowing, you know, we're just proceeding on this path without any real pause. I mean, the only people that are talking about it are the people that are uh, getting ground down by this, this lawnmower. But, um, but it's very worrying. It's a giant experiment for society, and we do not know how it's going to work out at all. Well, there are models out there um, going back to the pay-per-click or subscription modes. Yep. Um, if, if the whole you know, fundamental foundation of our democracy rests on the survival of high-quality uh, journalism uh, and information, uh, what can be done to get us to a point on a business end that can support that? Well, um, there are... Uh, I think three things. Uh, the first thing is uh, traditional news providers, uh, but particularly newspapers for just a moment, don't spend a huge amount of time thinking about the customer. And I, I, I'm really sorry to say that, but they really don't. Um, they're very much focused on all the news that's fit to print. I, I don't know how else to say it, rather than what is it that is, what is the reason that Tad Smith will grab either the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post on the train in the morning? But what is that about? Why does he pick up three? What's going on? Why does he, or on, on the Kindle, why might he use this one and not that one? There is something to that. Um, a perfect example, the Wall Street Journal has a certain psychological benefit of, from reading it, which is to say, whether you agree with it or not, a different thing. It's not actually about the content. It's about, I'm, and by the way, their, the, their own research will show this. Some people want to have the journal even when the company will not pay for it because they, they see themselves as important enough to have the journal. That's, their, that's the mindset. And understanding psychic and psychographic benefits of news <coughs> is a tremendously important thing that, frankly, media companies don't do. There are a lot of people that subscribe to The New Yorker. It piles up into their inbox. It's like classic New Yorker guilt. And they just can't turn them off every time the subscription comes around, even though they haven't read one in weeks. Why? Because they, they get The New Yorker. And that's part of their whole <laughs> mindset. And, and all sorts of media have this, this phenomenon. And understanding really what impels customers is tremendously important. Second thing, I think we need to have a very candid discussion about um, the business models. And what I mean by that is uh, you've got to pay. It's, somebody has to pay, and if advertisers aren't going to pay, you're going to pay. It's pretty straightforward. And what that means is you need to create a cost structure that will survive in a world where a smaller fraction of the total population pays. Um, and the third thing, I think, there does one needs to think about um, a pretty rigorous uh, enforcement of copyrights. And um, at, at the moment, we're pretty loose. Uh, we really are. Uh, the, the, copyright, the, the enforcement of copyright really does favor a tremendous amount of innovation on the internet and uh, innovation in content on the internet and sort of mashing things up and that stuff. That's, in my mind, tremendously positive from a societal technology thing. It has the cost, of, of, though, that copyrights are getting crushed. And we need to think more seriously about that for what it's worth. need to enforce them. You need to enforce them. So, <laughs> and in some areas, maybe you need to just change them. So. Let's uh, drill down a bit on, on Ted Smith and as a, the CEO of a significant media company. Um, Two things. You spent a couple minutes on your greatest achievement in 2008, and uh, on the balance of. Still here. Balance <laughs> 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 with uh, what frustrated you the most. Uh, it's been very, layoffs are crushing. Um, we announced uh, last Tuesday another 7% of the workforce. Notice I say the word another 7% of the work. We did 7% of the workforce in January. And it's, it, these stories are heartrending. And, and they are, thankfully, we have the financial capacity to be very generous. Um, but um, these are real people with real families. And each one has a story to tell. And they are hitting a job market that we know is, is gloomy right now. And so that's, that's really very, that's really problematic. I, I think the opposite side of that is I, I view it as a, um, a, a point of pride that I'm keeping that the team is keeping the organization very focused. We have a remarkably high sense of morale uh, despite the environment, and we are confident we're going to get through it, uh, and that it will be a brighter picture on the other side. But it's just really gut wrenching. To be honest, it's not. It's not much fun. It's not much fun, right? Okay, that was the 
the hard part. Let's go back to 2008. On, on beyond the achievement of still being, you know, above ground, above water, ah. um, is looking back on the year. What was, what was the high point for the year? Well, I should point out. Um, Reed Elsevier put its business to business properties, including mine, up for sale in 2008. So for nine months out of the year, I was in a sale process and I got to meet more about private equity than anybody ever wants to know. Um, and then, of course, when the Lehman Brothers collapsed, um, hit, the debt market fell apart and the sale was called off in December. But from, frankly, President's Day weekend to December 8th or whatever it was last year, we were technically for sale. Um, and that was. Um, uh, a tremendously distracting, difficult period for the organization. And so I would say the achievement actually was we went through that process, the process imploded as a result of factors outside of our control, and we still have managed to uh, uh, keep a team together, which is tremendously valuable in this environment. And also, we have a high degree of morale. We're very focused on the end game, despite those. And that's, that's we'll call that victory. So I mean, from my perspective, that's... I'm really proud of the team. They're doing a great job. So, beyond that, I, I can't think of anything else that would even be close to that. Be, that that would be the, the, the yeah. So, and, uh, forecasting forward, I mean, I'm, I'd like you to sort of share with us your snapshot of all the media industries, from broadcast to radio to internet to print. Say, a year from now, mm -hmm. and five years from now, what? might it look like? And also, what do you hope, how do you hope to impact that? What do you think you can do to shape that? Um, well, interesting. I just point out, I read this morning that Michael Wolf, the media columnist, said that 80% of the newspapers will be gone in 18 months. He said that last night at a, a, a yeah, well, it's, it's making a little bit of hay this morning. What are you saying? I think 18 months. 18 months, 80% were going to be gone. Um, and apparently there were a couple of <coughs> questions, and he clearly suggested that uh, one of them, the New York Times, that we all know very well, would change ownership within a year. I say he was on last night, I have to say. The, the, the Mike, Michael Wolf was, was on his game. Yeah. Was um, this at a dinner? Th this was at a, a conference, a Gotham media conference <coughs> something, and I'll remember the, the sponsor in a minute. Um, my perspective, uh, I think uh, general interest newspapers will have a very difficult uh, time uh, without any question. I, I don't know whether it's one year or three years, uh, but we're clearly headed to a very different time, difficult time. Uh, <coughs> consumer magazines, I think there will be fewer of them. I think we will experience a gentle print bounce in the consumer advertising-based media, and uh, they will then revert to a gentle 2 to 5% uh, print <coughs> advertising decline after the recession passes. At the moment, they're in the minus 20, 20 some odd percent territory. But that will revert to a more, more gentle decline. Um, the uh, business to business media will look a lot like consumer. Um, I think it'll be pretty close to consumer. And um, television, I think, will come in for a relatively straightforward 3 to 5% uh, secular decline offset by price increases. What I mean by that is the, uh, the volume of eyeballs will be declining, but the price increases will go up. Unfortunately, that dog, how long that dog hunts, I don't know. Uh, eventually, advertisers will see, you know, it's not really obvious to me why I should keep paying more each year for fewer people on the networks, and that's a real challenge. I think other things like radio, for example, will continue to be under pressure because they just don't have a competitively differentiated product for advertisers right now. They really don't. Uh, there's too many great opportunities to drive, uh, to find local audiences that you don't need uh, radio for. Um, what did I miss? Did I get them all? Uh, well, mobile. Uh, mobile, I think mobile is great. Um, the, the problem is it's great for the people that uh, have the service in your handset and everybody else that's but it, interesting think about these gentle models talk about a choke point Mo mobile continues to be a choke point they're really only two or three viable services right now I believe there will be some technology that brings innovation to that but at the moment uh, my hunch is if I asked you uh, which service you have you probably have one of two maybe one of three and as long as that's the behavior pattern we all exhibit and there's not a better technology um, we're going to be we're going to be having that. that they'll look a lot like media, a cozy media business for a while. But that's a lot of where the television product is going. 
Yeah, the problem is they can't make money. Uh, they're not the choke point. Um, uh, the, the, the TV producers are not the choke point. The, the choke point is AT&T. Mm -hmm. so, and if AT&T wants to put you on a mobile, although interestingly, let me take that back. Um, that's different from, say, Apple and iTouch, where you can download directly from the internet. But the problem there is Steve Jobs is the choke point. Uh, there's so, somebody, you know, wherever you go in these models, except straight over the internet, direct access, you, you, you're dealing with somebody else who's a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper's going to extract a toll, and unfortunately, the toll's pretty steep. But that is what's being said. It's all going to end up in our hand, in our mobile device. Yes. And so that, that is where television is going. And of course, that's where print, print is going as well. Although I have to say, television, um, my eyes aren't very good anymore. I have to say, television on a hand, it's not very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but now with my son loves it. He's nuts about it. But I just, I can't, uh, I can barely see it. So well, I'm sure they'll figure that problem. But with the switch uh, to digital in June, away from analog, mm -hmm. I, know, I know many people personally are just saying, I'm not going to pay for it because I'm getting all of it on the internet, all the content on the internet anyway. So I don't need that. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, I, you know, you could almost forget that, that we're switching from analog to digital because most people have had digital for quite a long time <laughs> via cable or Fios or one of those things. It almost sort of drops into the back of your mind. Um, but I would say the vast majority, certainly the vast majority of people that advertisers really have spent a lot of money chasing um, have had digital for quite a while. And so I, I don't see a huge transformation there. So. <clears throat> I did touch uh, sort of that, you know, we're on a college campus and, and dealing with students. Uh, students have to write papers, and uh, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, with citations, we don't allow Wikipedia as a as a viable, legitimate source. You know, it's it's, it's great. Like, Why? Um, because the reason is I could go on Wikipedia and do a whole section on ancient Turkish art, mm -hmm. and I know nothing about ancient Turkish art, and it would still be out there. So you don't believe that the crowd will somehow make it right? I, uh, I, I, know, I, I know that it doesn't. I mean, you can go on, you can go at You've been on changing all these sanctions. <laughs> <laughs> you've, been, you've been putting a little test words on it. See how the timing is? So, I mean, if, if, if I would know nothing about ancient Turkish art, you put Turkish, ancient Turkish art on Wikipedia, and that becomes the, the society's view of ancient Turkish art, at least uh, you know, in North America. That's a, that's a that's a great concern, and so going back to really his question is how um, what becomes credible? What who are the gatekeepers? Who who are the trained folk that will have two sources? And it's not just Nagel saying well ancient Turkish art was, which is highly irresponsible. Um, how you know that? It's a big question, but how, you know, you're the CEO of a major media company, how, how are those issues going to be uh, safe for faith? Well, we are careful to make sure that the stuff that we print is true. Um, I will say that is getting very hard to do. Um, and the reason is, is because in a world where bloggers can put up almost anything, they can print rumors, um, they can scoop us constantly. Um, and this is a real challenge, which is uh, we have, there's a, a blogger in Los Angeles, one prominent <laughs> one, who basically never comes out of her apartment. And everybody calls her and tells her the rumors going around. And fit, by the way, she runs them. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to sue her, one, because they don't have to like tangle with her. But secondly, this, she's completely judgment proof. So this, and more of the law generally favors her. Um, and she can run anything she wants to, and that's very tough for the people at Variety. Why? Because they have to actually get a source, um, and because they actually have a higher bar. But the, guess what? The thing that's kind of amazing is that people really like to look at the rumors and the blogs, and they really don't care all that much about whether it's true. That's the plain fact. And, and, and what that means is, on the content side, anyone that provides news is going to have an uphill battle against this. And, um, it's not obvious the way out. Um, I use Wikipedia, um, not on ancient Turkish art. Um, <laughs> say. Not after today. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, and I, I, I mean, a lot of people do use Wikipedia. I don't, I don't know how to say it. And what it means is, 
our, our threshold for what's true and what's real is gently dropping and maybe not so gently. It's kind of a scary statement, but it's true. So what we try to teach our students is how to see through that and how to be Good. selective. And that's a, a, a new skill uh, that we would like that generation to be especially good at because that, that's what they will need to do. And, th and they don't even seem to very much differentiate, I must say. Um, looking at the graduate level, I'm interested in how you see things shifting. You teach at, at NYU mm -hmm. Stern School. Yep. And how you see that model shifting with your graduate students that you're in contact with. What do you think that they need to be aware of in this new media environment that you're trying to communicate to? Well, um, uh, several things. One is I coach my students. By the way, I should tell you that the course, just in short, is, and it was mentioned earlier, Strategy and Finance for Entertainment, Media, and Technology Companies. Um, but for those of you who uh, remember television in the 70s, um, uh, there was a show called Paper Chase with, uh, I think it was John Woodhouse or somebody, John Houseman. Yes. And um, uh, th this is very much, it's a class just like this, maybe a little bit larger. It's 70 students. It's all Socratic method. Um, and it's, it's wild. But the, the point of the class is very much to get students to be thinking about not only the business models and the effects very much what we're talking about here, but also their careers, because they're second year business school students. And so one of the key messages I have for them is what you just said, which is one, in a world where you have to be a responsible citizen, think fundamentally about taking in the information and evaluating it. You have to evaluate. The internet will not evaluate information for you. You have to do it. Um, second thing is choose your career wisely. There are a lot of businesses that um, appear to be stable, uh, good, positive businesses now, and technology will clobber them. Uh, innovation will proceed. And interestingly, people that care about making a lot of money will often um, go to or migrate to places that seem to be out of favor or seem to have relatively few prospects because they are going to get in ahead of the curve. Um, it's, fa it's fascinating if you look at, and this is a series of books on this, if you look at where people have been very successful in their careers, a lot of things, a lot of it was a lot of tremendous practice and work, but a lot of it was in there that they were in the right place at the right time and they took advantage of it. And by the way, they were out of favor places, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. Um, so uh, <coughs> I tell them that. And the third thing I tell them is, uh, to a great extent, they really, it's really important, I mean, it's amazing. They really need to seek out a truth, not just evaluate it, but find the facts. Um, it's so easy just to go on someone else's word, but actually getting facts is a really remarkable thing. They're, and the facts are out there, but most people don't take the time and effort. There's a cost to finding facts. It was a cost that used to be borne by the media companies, and now, it's not worn by the media copies, they can't afford it anymore, so we're going to have to get the facts. And whether it is ancient Turkish art, which is a good example, um, or something else, if you are lazy about facts, that says a lot. It's worrying. That was a great conversation for the two kids in Concordia. Um, we wanted to cut it and, and open for questions. Um, yeah. So, uh, counterpunch. <laughs> First of all, compliments on how well you articulated the problems and uh, uh, and what was behind them. I, I particularly like select reference to selectivity being the strength of print early on. And if you look at the demise of life, look at the Saturday Evening Post, they were the first the general interest books were the first to go. And the books with, with the content, selective content, are still around and may still have a future, which your own business is related to. Um, on the question of, of who supervises, who is the conscience of all this, and this is happening, um, do you have concerns about the federal government stepping in and, and doing it, or do you think that they're just going to be indifferent? Well, the federal government does supervise the media in China in North Korea, in Cuba, <laughs> um, and, a, and, a long, and by the way, in Zimbabwe, um, in a long list of, of uh, places, and, um, and it doesn't do a particularly good job of it. Um, 
Uh, in fact, I'm at some pains. Actually, there, there are, it also, by the way, does a little bit of it, of course, in the UK with the BBC. And that and does an extraordinary job of it there, but it, it sets up a lot of checks and balances to manage that. And also, it has a robust free market environment there as well. Um, but they still have their scandals. Um, I, I, I'm a little cautious about the federal government doing anything like that. Um, because they, you know what it is? It's, it, they report to our elected officials. And we, and we don't elect our officials. I, by the way, we're putting them in a horrible position to manage our media. I mean, it, it, it's not, it, it, honestly, you, they would have to be saints to oversee and supervise the media and not do the obvious thing, which is try to get reelected, which is what they do. That's, that's kind of what they're all about. It, it's hard to see that we, we, we would expect a lot of them not to have a conflict of interest that they would exert. Question. Uh, where, where do you see organizations like the New York Times and the Washington Post five years from now? I think the New York Times will be owned by a billionaire who wants to own it. I, I really do. Like um, a baseball team. Like a baseball. I don't think it'll be a Vanny franchise. Um, and well, honestly, a perfect example is Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch loses. I don't know what. I've heard the most recent number I heard was $70 million a year on the New York Post. If you think he's closing the New York Post, I'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. As long as he can go on doing this, that's a labor of love. He loves it. And, you know, there are people that own islands and there are people that own baseball teams and might as well own the New York Times, too. It, but it, you know, you could be a real estate billionaire and you own the New York Times, you get a really great dinner party ticket, that's for sure. Chad, <laughs> <laughs> right at the beginning, you heard that. Uh, Rates for online advertising have fallen off, plunging. Uh, plunging. And that was really the, the unexpected event in the second half of, of our age. And yes. On then on into, uh, into 09. And that, that's really a fundamental point in the whole business discussion. Could you just elaborate a little on that? Yeah. Um, the quick context the traditional thinking that we had was that the revenue would be a little bit less when it migrated from print to online because the cost of online was lower. But that we would have, traditional media companies would have robust advertising dependent models online. Um, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, and by the way, I actually did a piece that uh, Don McAllister knows called the inflection point that talked about this um, at the time. <coughs> with the benefit of hindsight, it, it was never well, my view, I'm not saying about anybody else's. My view was never really well thought through, because uh, anyone seeing what was happening online could realize that the more times everyone in this room clicks on a page, the more times an ad is served up. As more and more clicks are served up, more and more ads are served up. In other words, more inventory becomes available. Remember, when there's a magazine, you only have so many pages. Now, if I get into a Facebook email-based dialogue with one of you, the number of pages goes up exponentially. And then when we add millions and millions of people to the internet and we give them all broadband and they start exploring and they start chatting and they do all the other things, the number of places to advertise explodes. Well, the classic rule of economics, right, is that the revenue will drop to the marginal cost of production in a free market. And what you literally have online is the perfect free market and the revenue has, in fact, dropped to the marginal cost. There's just one trick. The marginal cost of my clicking to create advertising inventory for the media company is zero. There's no cost, which means the revenue isn't worth much unless you can figure out a way to add more value to it. And so ad networks grew up online very rapidly to fill the remnant space with advertising to sell an audience in a generic way. And what that did was even drove further pressure to drive the revenue down. And so I'll give you an example. It, it wasn't too long ago when Yahoo could probably sell ad inventory uh, for $30 per thousand. And now it can sell advertising uh, online for a dollar or 30 cents per thousand. And by the way, when I'm talking a couple of years. Just went 30 to 3 or 30 to 1 or 30 to 30 cents. Um, that's a tremendous downward deflation in the online. And by the way, that was seeable. It wasn't like because of the internet people suspended economics. I mean, we all sh I should have seen it. Shame on me. You mentioned Google as a way that we find 
information as, as a, essentially de facto filter. Is there a business model for a, an intelligent filter or a human filter? <laughs> Google would be mad at me. Okay. Well, um, are you a Wall Street Journal subscriber? That's a human filter. And you're paying $199 a year. Maybe you get a deal. but So you're willing to pay $199 a year for a very thoughtful group of people to filter what you think is important on business. So yeah. Are you implementing that in your own business? Yeah, Variety will have the paywall go up relatively soon. By the way, another filter doesn't need to be just news. By the way, we talk about entertainment. There's a filter called HBO or Showtime, which filters what you want and selects the stuff that you think. And if you're paying for it, you're making some implicit uh, assessment about whether you think that human filter works for you or not. So, uh, Ted, you said earlier that electronic media has gone from three percent to thirty-four yeah. percent of revenue since two thousand. I'm curious, what's been the change in percents over the same time for business publications, trade shows, and the other classifications? Um, uh, well, I hadn't, I wasn't including trade shows in that. Uh, yeah, so uh, trade shows have gone up substantially as a percentage of the total revenue. If you look at a revenue as a pie with print, electronic, and trade shows, um, trade shows have grown substantially over time. Print has declined sharply, and online has exploded. In short, I'd need to think through the math because the trade shows make it a little bit complicated for me. So. Let me, let me think about that. Question back there. Uh, what successful business models are there in Western Europe that could be uh, used here? Uh, you mean in media? Yeah. Well, ours is a good example. Um, we sell uh, scientific uh, information, healthcare information, and legal information for fees to professional users. The professional users will pay substantial amounts for that information, and we put it in a phenomenal database as well as search capability. So if you want to know what the latest, greatest thinking on otolaryngology is, chances are you're using one of our databases, and the other chance is that you are, your, your academic uh, uh, institution is paying a fortune for it. Excuse me. I take that. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> Don't put that on the web. <laughs> Um, well, actually, the, the great irony is that databases are all around us, uh, and most of them are available. Uh, we spend the time, effort, and money to create deep scientific knowledge and, data, and put that on electronic databases, and then have uh, uh, scientific peers judge it, and then sell the access to that information. But there are databases literally all around us, and, and, and so there are databases everywhere. In fact, one very interesting set of business models is media companies that do nothing but aggregate databases. I'll give you an example. One of our companies is called Hotfrog, H-O-T-F-R-O-G. Um, what this is is we license in databases. We apply search engine optimization technology to it. We put it on the web. You can update your own, for example, directory listing if you run a small business. And that makes millions of dollars a year, and it's all Google AdSense. These databases are from the government and, and, and university research centers? No, um, uh, they're often private. Um, and, and for example, if you simply collect what researchers are thinking about otolaryngology, for example, for lack of a better thing to think about, and you aggregate it and you apply some insight to it, you create a database. If you put it in a computer and make it accessible. There are also databases from uh, the government, a perfect example of that is our risk business, and this is the business of what we call authenticating new employees. If you put people on background checks when they come in, or if you're a homeland security and you want to chase people down, we've got a database that will quickly aggregate all the information that the government um, can see about an individual into a large screen, and then you can find out what it is you need to know. For example, when you come into the border, um, they will quickly run a quick scan on you, and that is an aggregated database provided by, I believe, a, a, a private entity that quickly says a quick scan, Tad Smith, your name is not Tad Smith, your name is Thomas S. Smith, we see you, we know you live at 16 Oriel Avenue in Bronxville, and um, this is, and you're clear. So somebody had to pay for the creation, the collection of these, of this, these sets of data. Sure. And you're not, I mean. Yeah, we, we do. We do. Lots of private companies do. Ted, uh, people like uh, Harold Bloom and, and others have been talking about dumbing of America for a long time. 
street, you know. For, for well, we got to be pretty dumb by now, then. <laughs> for those of us in the uh, academic enterprise, we're probably going to be the last bastion where we're still in love with paper, the feel, the smell, mm -hmm. the sound, all that kind of stuff. With, with young kids growing up, what do you see uh, emerging in, in the field of education, how people learn? Is University of Phoenix kind of stuff going to be the model of the future, which I hope not? Um, well, I have an invested interest, you know. <laughs> uh, what, what's going to happen? Well, I have to say, despite everything I've said for the better part of an hour, I'm quite optimistic. Um, I, I, and I, for whatever reason, uh, there are just so many examples of where our children are learning better and faster. Um, the explosion, and when you see my, I have young kids, as I said, the interaction that they have with technology and the love that Harrison has for books. By the way, not the traditional, yesterday evening he came in and he said, Daddy, I want to get a Kindle. And I'm thinking, groan, you're not getting a Kindle. And, um, but nevertheless, he wanted to see how it worked and he wanted to go look up books and he started banging away on my Kindle to find stuff. Um, and moreover, although it's unsettling to us, when um, a child can take in the television and he can take in a book and he can do a game simultaneously and you quiz him about what's going on and he actually knows what he's talking about at the end of it, it's extraordinary. And their brains are really wired in ways that can take in information that where we needed to concentrate and to think about it in a linear fashion. So I'm, I'm optimistic. In terms of the broader point about res responsible citizens, you know, elite, members of the elite have been saying that our society has been in decay almost since 1787. Um, and eventually they may be right, but I don't think that day is this day. Um, I really do believe that the, the offsetting effects of the internet, um, extraordinary, I mean, I, I wish I could remember the name of it. Um, we had the conversation around the dinner table the other day, and um, my, Julia, my daughter, had fed Rosie our dog chocolate, and Rosie threw up or something like that. And, and I, I said, well, you know, they're allergic to chocolate. And Harrison then said, my Harrison, my nine-year-old said, no, Daddy, it's X. There is a certain technical term for what this is, when, you know, some reaction with the stomach, and I'd forgotten what the name was. Um, and I said, I looked at him like he was out of his mind. I said, how did you know that? He says, oh, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think to check to see whether he was right. I couldn't believe it. I literally couldn't believe it. And, and there's an extraordinary amount of information in the hands of our, our, our youth. And they are they're really ravenous for information. I think it's exciting. Um, I don't know about the University of Phoenix. Uh, we'll see. Um, but I, I think a high quality version of the University of Phoenix could be interesting. And I would encourage any higher <coughs> institution of higher learning uh, to be thinking about exploiting all these business models and to be thinking about what is the best way to reach our customer, which is really the student. copyright laws. I wondered what, or at least the copyright um, protection, uh, do you think that the law should be amended, and if so, how, or do you think that people aren't suing enough, or they can't find the copyright infringers, or they be infringers of judgment proof, or what is really the problem? You mentioned that, I was just curious as to what, what really is involved. Well, in the, the law on fair use, uh, and this is a, a technical issue about what content can be used in a fair way on the internet without having to remit a f uh, payment to the original content creator is, from the perspective of most copyright holders, uh, a little bit too loose. And what I mean by that is, if a blogger copies an article from Variety and posts it in a blog, I don't get paid. Now, you could argue, and by the way, that person could then search engine optimize their blog so that they show up first on the results page for Google, and I'm on page 27, and they've got my content, and they're getting they're, they're getting paid off my content. Um, I understand the notion for why that was. There ought to be legitimate areas for fair use on the internet. But at the moment, it's a little bit over the top. And I know the newspaper industry just took Google to task for this. Uh, the Publishers Association also went after Google on this. Obviously, there's some uh, carrying on right now with YouTube. And I think we just need to be a little bit more careful with how we use copyrights online. And of course, the music industry is all over this. And the, the film business is on this as well. We're not really particularly enforcing them very much. It's not a high priority uh, for our regulators. And um, I think the people who create content view it that we need to be much more effective on it. So uh, then, say your company should be pursuing more cases, you think? Or, or you... No, uh, honestly, this is a, this is a good example. Um, I, I, our company is a little bit different <coughs> from consumer media because um, 
businesses typically don't steal. Human beings steal. Um, and it's, it's really true. Uh, it, it's very unusual for our, uh, for large corporations, or even medium or small size corporations, to take the business risk of stealing somebody's content. It, and so we don't generally have a copyright issue. I was just saying, speaking generically from businesses that serve consumers. So nobody's going to steal the Lancet. I mean, it's just why. <laughs> Pay for it. You mentioned earlier that you had a number of layoffs, and that's obviously very distressing. What, what hope do you have for the kids who are graduating in May or who have just graduated and want to get into the media business and have studied it, and everywhere they turn and they see layoffs and hiring for you? Any hopes or any suggestions? Well, I, I would look at the things that are going to be playing offense in media. Um, internet services, um, paid content models, um, tools. What I mean by tools is uh, it's one thing to get the Wall Street Journal online. It's another thing to get it downloaded directly to your Kindle. It's another thing to get it in a video version on your mobile phone. There are businesses that are trying to do the latter three and not the former. Um, and I think the latter three are pretty exciting areas because they are playing offense. They're not, they're not trying to protect old business models that are under subject to erosion. What they are is on disruptive sides of innovation. And I would argue those are very exciting places. For the non-business uh, members, who are non-business mm -hmm. students who aspire to be media, I, I love, I mean, we just talked about it just 10 seconds outside. but. Um, one of the things that's very exciting about media now is that uh, if you are a person with something to say and you can think about creatively branding yourself, um, whether you are an artist or a producer or a director or a commentator or an editor or anything, the opportunity without having to deal with a choke point media to create a brand around yourself and actually be a really expressive, creative contributor to our society is tremendous. It's better than it ever was. Um, so my, my sense is if you are an artist or you are an editor or a writer or you're creatively inclined, you've got a fabulous, uh, you've got a little bit, you've got to think cleverly about how to market yourself, but you've got a, a really great life in this environment. Those were Sheila Johnson last month. She got the Black Energy and she sold for $3 million. It was good. And, uh, it was a good gig if you could get it. Yeah, yeah, good gig. And, I asked her how that opportunity would present itself, knowing what we know today about how competitive the landscape is. Sure. And, and you know, classic fashion. She says, "When uh, you know, one door closes, many windows open." It, it didn't really answer my question, but that's kind of the way she thinks, and she's shown, you know, obviously shown her success. I'd ask, and it's along the lines of what you just asked. As the media consolidation continues, as we continue to get bombarded with different options, different venues, different places to go, you know, where do you see your business and how do you take advantage of the changes that are going to occur and they're accelerating rapidly? And how, how, you know, obviously you're on the block and what happens to you? And, and but we're, we're not on the block anymore, okay. I should point that out. <laughs> so, so how does that look? Oh, just for a second. I do, I do want to take a break here. If uh, any of you need to run to the station uh, to get a train, uh, please leave quietly. There is a band out in the front oval if anybody needs a ride to the train station. Uh, but we're going to continue with the Q&A for a while. So please stay if you can. By all, thank you. Um, well, I, I think most importantly, I, I, don't, I believe content alone is no longer king. And so what we're doing is working very aggressively to find ways that we can embed our content into tools that people use that enhance whatever is either their productivity or the benefits or convenience of what they're doing. Um, and whether we talked about mobile, but we could, look, we could think about the iPod. We could think about um, the thing I mentioned almost offhandedly earlier. It's one thing to have a database that will tell you what the construction costs of this room are. It's another thing to take that database and put it into an online tool that allows you to model this building and then change the model and automatically recompute the cost of this room. That takes content, which is in a database such as construction costs, and turns it into a tool. And whether you are in business to business or whether you are in online consumer media, um, tools are really exciting places to be because people love tools. 
I mean, they, and by the way, it's not just tools has a certain pedestrian kind of work related quality. I don't mean it that way. iPods are tools. Um, and you know, one, it's one thing to have music in your stereo. It's another thing to have it in your iPod where you can walk around with it. It, it just makes it, by the way, then you get the, you could actually look up on the iPod. You can change the settings. You can figure out, and by the way, the Kindle does the same thing, except you can automatically download new, new music. So there are, there are, the way we think about enhancing what customers really need beyond just the content, I think, is a real mission ahead for us. We're very focused on that area, and I think it, it, it will benefit certainly our shareholders. Uh, Chad, in, in the healthcare industry, uh, do you else you're doing anything in the trade with respect to either electronic medical records, electronic prescribing? If not, did you look at that? Is it where is that? Sure. Business? Uh, sure right. answer. Sure. Um, uh, we think there's a tremendous opportunity to, to chase it, and um, we do have some projects in there. And the name, frankly, escapes me at the moment, so I can't really answer your question. But um, I have personally seen what we're doing there. Uh, the gadgets are phenomenal, and I think it's a very exciting area to chase. I should also say it's not a huge surprise for me because in 1990, I'm going to date myself, 1993, in the first half of 1993, I was at McKinsey working on a project for what was then called Blue Cross and Blue, Blue Cross of California, which is now called WellPoint, and the specific area there was medical records and how to make them more efficient so that we all could re improve that the value that information brings reduces the cost of, of healthcare, and that's what we were trying to do at the time. It's still the same mantra, like, like 16 years ago, frightening. So. Part of it's generational. I mean, like Bill were talking about earlier, a lot of doctors like writing scripts on a piece of paper, keeping writing the records out, and the new generation of kids are more tech savvy, they're more comfortable with electronic. I have surgery this afternoon, as a matter of fact, and when I went to, for the first thing, the doctor, who was, I'm thinking, 10 to 15 years older than I am, um, took some quick photos, popped them up on the computer screen, typed in a couple of notes, rotated the computer screen so I could see exactly what he was going to do, and today he's going to put me under the knife and do whatever it was he said he was going to do, and I hope I'll wake up, but we'll see how it goes. So, uh, But it was all electronic, and he's got a database there. And I assume everything associated, such as the submission of the forms, will presumably be electronic. And I'm, I'm hopeful that. And you know, he had uh, quite an impressive mop of gray hair. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is there more chance for error? You think on the screen? I mean, in other words, when you read an email or something, it's never as good as when it's typed. Is it when it comes to you in the mail? I mean, don't you think there is a less likelihood that, that uh, people make uh, the right grammar? Or well, if you've ever read a galley, which is the sort of book that they submit prior to actual publication, it's uh, and you ever read the first draft, it's got a ton of errors in it. it. So it's not necessarily so much the medium that will change the quality of the information; it's the number of people editing and looking at it very often. Um, and and so I, I don't. I, I, it's not obvious to me that, for example, a a database typed into a computer, followed by a spell check, and some sort of computer-generated sensory screen to make sure that this works. And by the way, that stuff is already in the marketplace. Uh, customer service units, for example, use that all the time. If they're taking your information online and you give them one too many digits or the wrong digit, or you give them 10709 rather than 10708 when you're from Bronxville, um, they'll stop and they'll say, I'm sorry, sir, that, that zip code isn't working for me for some reason. So the technology will find a way through that. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time.